Man. I love that. Ryan, he contacted me last week. He said, hey, man, I got a few ideas as we wrap up mixtape. I was like, okay, all right. And then he called me later on. and said, I have a rap. I said, okay, white boy, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got a rap. And uh, shared that rap with me. I said, man, we got to get that on video. We got to get that working. And so, man, give it up for Ryan. He did a great job. Come on now. Teacher by day, rapper right. by night. That's right. Vanilla Sky ice. Sky is limitless. Yeah. Let me him. recognize the song. Ice, ice, baby. Ice, ice, baby. <laughs> Calm down. Heathens, heathens. That's all right. We love you. Man, we're so excited you guys are here. And, uh, man, I hope you've enjoyed Mixtape. We're in week six of Mixtape, Love, Sex, and Marriage. And, uh, man, it's just been an incredible hearing story after story, hearing uh, really just what God is doing through this message and through the series. And, uh, man, I guess it's, it's just been incredible hearing what God is doing here at Avenue Church. So raise your hand if you are married in this place. Raise your hand if you're married. If you're married, raise your hand if you've been married longer than 10 years. Longer than 10 years. All right. Longer than uh, 15. We're going 15, 20. I can see, I can see the proud ones. Right? They're like, are you dead at? Right? 25? 25, 30. 30 years? 30? We got two? Right, we got two here. All right, over 30 years, right? 40? 50? 75? <laughs> 40 years, right? Give it up for these guys. You did it. So uh, you will come up here and we will come down there. I'm joking. And so that's awesome. Raise your hand if you are engaged. You're engaged, you're about to be married. You're about to be married. Anyone, anyone? We had two last, uh, last. Woo! What, what? There you go. All right, we got somebody, right? He just found out. No, I'm just kidding. That's awesome. Don't do it. Don't do it. No, it's awesome. And so give it up for the new, we're about to be married, right? I was going to say, like, raise your hand if you're supposed to be engaged. No, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Raise your hand if you are um, single. Be proud. Put it up. If you're single, put it up. Look around. See what we've got to work with. Look around. All right, that's awesome. That's incredible. And, uh, man, I got to tell you, we've had an amazing time talking about uh, being single, talking about being married, talking about how to date, talking about our foundation in that pyramid that Ryan had in that video. As we started spiritual, we go to social, interpersonal, emotional, and then happy face. And that is our desire for you throughout this entire series. So if you missed it and you're like, pineapple, what's he talking about? Make sure you listen in the podcast uh, over the past five weeks and begin to see all that's why uh, he had that in that video. And it's just been incredible. Even someone told us this week, you know what? I had so many soul ties at home. I begin to throw things away. And as I begin to do that, I begin to find, I begin to feel freedom in my life. As I give what, that old ex-boyfriend sweater. And as I begin to throw that away. Why? Because God is setting us free and getting us ready for healthy relationships in Jesus' name. So it's been incredible. So let's throw up, my wife and I, we scoured the web for deep theological marriage images. And so we're going to put the first one up in here. Uh, we're starting our lives together. Let's spend all our money in one day. Right? Yeah. The wedding day. <laughs> right? She's like, no. Right? Even I, I think our parents were like, if you just elope, right, here's a bunch of money. I was like, let's do it. Let's do it. Anyways, here's the next one. What's it's like living with a man? Anyone, any ladies? <laughs> ladies, be proud. That's okay. Now, for me, that's compromised. Like, it, it got close. <laughs> it got close to the basket, and it's, it's right there, right? That's close. And so, no, no, no words here, huh? I'll keep going. Next slide. I leave a towel on the ground, but the bathroom's considered a mess. Where's my boys at? Where's my guys at? Oh, I'm messy. Oh, I'm sorry. Tough crowd today, man. They're kind of quiet. Huh? The guys are like. <laughs> They're afraid to get hit. <laughs> yeah, I know. Here's the next one. Don't try to understand women. Women understand women. They hate each other. I, that's not. That's not. I, that's not true. That's not true. How many? That's not true. That's not true. Here's one more. Here's another one. If two people love each other, nothing is impossible except deciding where to eat. <laughs> Married people, how many know I'm talking about, right? If you're dating too, right, just make a decision. A lot of people ask me, like, if we were on the newlywed game, we'd probably fail. Because my wife doesn't have anything. Like, what's your favorite, what's your wife's favorite restaurant? I'd be like, I, I don't know. I, I food, something with food there, right? What's your favorite restaurant? Whatever I'm in the mood for. Whatever, yeah. We're never eating, right? Whatever she's, <laughs> Taco Bell, right? And so it's just been, uh, it's just been, 
Not Taco Bell. Never. No, no, never, never. <laughs> and so it's just been incredible what God has been doing throughout this series. And so we would love to tag team today. We'd love to just tell our story, but also just to cap and re, uh, to finalize this sermon, this series to say, you know what? God has hope for your marriage. God has hope for your life, that he can do anything through Christ in Jesus' name. And so I got to tell you that uh, over 12 years ago, she corrected me last service, by the way. I was like, oh, I was like, you know, nine years ago. She's like 12. 12 years ago, I flew to Las Vegas for a job interview, and I was at a church, and when we sat at a table, it was interns and staff, and they said, we're going to allow people to ask you questions, too. This is kind of a group interview. I said, cool, no, no sweat. I got this, right? I got this. And I uh, sat at the table. When I sat down on the other end of the table was this beautiful, uh, she was glowing. She had blonde hair. Uh, just a beautiful woman named Lindsay, this one, yeah. And so I was, my goodness. But I was there for an interview. So I was like, bounce, right? I was like, let's stay the course, Jeremy. Let's stay the course. And so... I said, anyone here have a, uh, any questions for me? And no one in the, in the room raised her hand, but this one did. She went, boom. And I was like, yes, right? Like, yes, I'm available. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yes, I'm single, you know? And so I said, yes, uh, yes, ma'am. What's your question? And she said, uh, what makes you qualified for this position? And I was like, wow. <laughs> wow. Really? I was like, wow. Okay. Like, I like that. A little feisty, right? I enjoy that. And so, <laughs> and so I said, hey, this is where my background is. This is what I've done. Da, da, da. I shut her down in a good way. Like, here you go. Boom. Anyone else have a question? She goes, mm. And, she, and she's like the smart girl in class, right? No one but her. Boom. And I was like, anyone else? Like, anyone? Hey, custodian, do you have a question? <laughs> like, anybody? And so I go like, yes. And she goes, you're single, right? I was like, yes, I am. And she goes, how are you going to minister to our girls in our youth ministry? And I was like, wow. <laughs> wow. So I had to answer that, right? Could I defend myself for no, just a moment? No. no. We were given homework to come with at least two <laughs> questions. It is not my fault that nobody else in that room had the guts to raise their hand or did their homework. And so I was just doing what I was told to do. But he did have really good answers. I can't lie. They All were right. really good. All right. That's right. But do your homework, because you might get married. <laughs> and I tell you that because when I saw her, I was like, no, I'm interviewing. I don't want to be distracted by that. But God spoke to me. And you might have heard that before. You're like, that's weird, right? Uh, it was even a uh, college, prof uh, college president at a Christian college. And a guy came in, and he said, sir, God spoke to me, and I'm supposed to marry that girl. And he was like, oh, really? Well, you're the third guy to say God spoke to you to marry that same girl. <laughs> But when I said, you know what, I think she's the one for, for my life, I began to know her, began to hang out with her, began to start at spiritual, go into the social. I waited eight months. Some of y'all can't wait eight seconds. Hello, right? <laughs> you available? Not anymore. Come on, right? And begin that process of just praying to say, God, is this the one for my life? That God, I believe you have a plan for my life. And so as we can begin to go through that process to say, you know what, I begin to pray and pray until finally I said, you know what, I'm going to ask her out. And then we began a process of dating, got married, and uh, it's been 10, 10 amazing years. See, but what Jeremy didn't know is that prior to him even mentioning that he liked me is that I had a list. And I actually brought a copy of this list. I made it in April of 2005. So this is a 13-year-old list because, hear me, an advice was given to me long ago that if you are even considering getting married or getting into a serious relationship with somebody, you make a list. Make a list of things that you desire. Make a list of things that you won't compromise in. Some men, your list would be like, I want her to love Jesus and I want her to be hot. Done. That's, that's not it, that's enough. It. That's it. That's good. <laughs> it's not that's enough. That. So let me, let me show you. So I put this. I said, Jesus, my heart and my life is yours, Lord. I got to sound spiritual, okay? So I deserve to wait on the man that you have personally handpicked for me. There are things I won't compromise, but of course, I have desires. So my first page is all Jesus-y. So I tell him I want a man after God's own heart, that he wants to be close. I want him to be humble, not prideful. Humble. He needs to be a leader. He's got character and integrity. Number seven. Number eight is he's kind. Number nine, he's got to have a family. But here's the important stuff. On page two. I need him to be between six foot and six foot three. I wrote that down. 
I mean, there you go. Barely, just barely. He's at six foot. Brown hair. I said tan skin. And I said, okay, he can tan pretty easily. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that was early on. It just didn't last. Okay, so strong. I put he can pick me up so easily. I was 21, guys. Deal with it. Brown or green eyes, creative and exciting. <laughs> I put so handsome, come on, because sometimes we're like, well, if he just loved Jesus, you got to look at his face every single day. Woo! And because I was 21, I wrote hot with an exclamation mark. Nice hair, not too short, not too long. I should have put, we'll be there when he's 60, but I didn't write that down, so be detailed. I put has to dance, even if he can't. <laughs> Like sports, but isn't a fanatic. <laughs> and I say that because I'm telling you what, when I dated people, or people were interested in me, or I was interested in someone, I really went to my list and I said, am I compromising? Now I'm not just talking the petty stuff like how he looks, but am I compromising? One of my things was I wanna be a team with somebody. Well, I really, really liked someone I was dating, but they didn't wanna be a team with me. They didn't believe that I had a place in ministry, and so I had to look at my list and realize, I'm already compromising on my list. And I had to end that relationship. So if you are single. Bye, Felicia. Bye, Felicia. <laughs> if you are single, make a list. Get alone with Jesus, not after you watch The Notebook or some dumb romantic comedy, because hear me, he gets paid millions of dollars to act that way. I don't know how people make out when they first wake up in the morning. Your breath stank. Like, we have a rule. <laughs> Go brush your teeth and <laughs> It's all a lie. And so, <laughs> that was not in my notes. That was for me. Your mom's like. Anyway, make a list. Now, if you're married, don't you dare make a list. You get to make a prayer list. You don't get to make a what I want in a spouse list because it ain't you. You don't get to do that. You make a prayer list. They're like, put that list back up. <laughs> Someone told us, too, that the most important decision you're ever going to make is your relationship with Jesus Christ. But your second most important decision is who you spend the rest of your life with, your spouse. And so that is something that we don't take lightly. That is something that we really want to contemplate, and that list really helped me out when determining, did this guy fit in? <laughs> Just kidding. So if you're taking notes today, I want you to get your phones out, get your, you know, whatever piece of paper you have, even the back of our connect card. And we just want to kind of take on a short journey this morning. And the first thing I want you to write down is get a vision for marriage. Get a vision for marriage. Last week we talked about without vision, people perish. So without vision, people cast off restraint. And so if you don't have vision for your marriage, then how, how, are we, how you know, where do I start? Where do I begin in this process? And somebody, uh, even for us, uh, I am so grateful for premarital counseling. If you're in this room, you're like, premarital what? And you're like, what'd you say? And that's the problem because many of us, we're not equipping ourselves for beyond the day that we're married. We're not asking the, the after questions in the before stage. We have to ask those things to say, you know what, help me to see what I'm not seeing. Because I'm seeing all this, and I'm seeing the wedding day, it's going to be amazing. But help me to see beyond that day. Help me to see 40 years down the road, 30, 20 years down the road. Help me to have a vision for my life. And many of us, I mean ladies, most of the ladies in this room, from the day you were born, I think you're like two years old, you're like wedding, right? And you're like uh, planning it. You got Pinterest boards with, with all kinds of pins. And, and she told me all about Pinterest. So all kinds of pins. I, uh, I got one. Be, be proud. And so all these Pinterest boards. And, and you have all these ideas. And it's all about the wedding day. And we'll make investments in that. Like my wife said, we'll scroll through and begin to get inspiration. And all these things on decor and, and ideas and things like that. But then we won't spend $10 on a book. A book that will help us and equip us for the future. We won't, we won't spend time in premarital counseling or, or we won't make time. For, I'm busy. I know you are. But you've got to invest in the future. You've got to invest in what you're going into. And so I just want to encourage you that. We've we, we got to ask those questions. And that's what we want to do today. We want to help you. The premarital helps you to see what you don't see. And even in premarital, we learn uh, the unspoken rules. What are unspoken rules? Those are rules you brought into your relationship from a past relationship. Those are unspoken rules that you say, you know what, uh, here's a question for you if you're getting married, right? If you're getting married, where are you going to spend Christmas? 
Well, we always go to my parents' house. Well, we always go to my parents' house. Well, what do we do, right? And begin to say, you know what? We, we need to hash this out. We need to have a plan before uh, we get married. We need to know exactly what the, uh, what, what, we need to know exactly what we're doing and communicate everything that we're going through. Now, my wife and I, we have four sets of parents, right? I make, I make my dad proud, right? I, we, make, we have four sets of parents. And so doing all that and beginning to juggle time and say, you know what? My folks did it this way, so we're going to do it this way. But how many know that's not going to happen? You just have, you have to say, what are the compromises that we can have? And so we have to really avoid a fight by focusing on vision instead of the present to avoid that fight. And so I want you to write this down. Here's how you spell marriage. Many of us will say M-A-R-R-I-A-G-E, right? Many of us will spell marriage that way, but this is how you spell marriage. W-O-R-K, right? You're like, that's work. No, that's marriage. All right, that's how, that, that's, that's how uh, marriage is hard work and all the married people said. Yeah. Amen, why? Because relationships are hard. That's why we're making mixtapes, right? Why? Because marriage is a lot of work. So write this down, number two is, is to uh, work on your foundation. Work on your foundation. Get a vision for your marriage, but then work on your foundation. And when you focus on your vision, then you're forced to face your foundation. You say, well, pastor, I, 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 this is the vision I have for a great marriage, a marriage 40 years down the road. That's my vision for this marriage, a godly marriage. And you're, okay, that's amazing. Now, how come your foundation won't lead you to that vision? We have to work on our foundation as we begin to uh, have a relationship. Your foundation will then determine your expectations. Let me, let me explain it. Typically, your relationships are built on your past experiences. So we learn what we want to do or what we don't want to do based on what we've gone through or what we've observed. See, if you're not married, I want you to know that on your wedding day, if you choose to get married, your past will play a role on the days after that wedding day. What we've gone through, what we've experienced, doesn't just go away. No, it, it has a way of influencing our decisions and influencing our actions long after that wedding day. See, we're supposed to learn from the past. The past, our failures, the things that didn't work out, those can be our greatest teachers. Failures can be our greatest lessons to learn from. But if we don't settle our past, if we don't work through things and get healing from things, say you had a really uh, hard just upbringing and you never saw a good example of a husband and wife. In fact, you swore you were never going to get married because you didn't see anybody who did it right. But now all of a sudden you're in love and you naturally just want to spend the rest of your life with this person. And so guess what? I'm going to make the plunge. Well, what you don't know is you're taking that plunge with all your ideas of what marriage is, all your ideas of what it is and what it isn't. But what if those things got healed? See, that's what we're saying. Have a vision so you can build a foundation, but recognize that your past does play a part in it, and it's got to be dealt with. See, Proverbs 14, 8. Write this down. Proverbs 14, 8. The wisdom of the prudent. Now, that's an old word, huh? You're like, did you get that from Downton Abbey? No, I got that from the Bible. But prudent means wise. It means caring and providing for the future. So the wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to their ways. But the folly of fools is deception. So in giving thought to your ways, you're recognizing those habits. I think sometimes we think that if I just don't recognize it, if I don't give attention to it, it won't bother me. It's not true. It is still there. And so the wise, uh, the prudent will give thoughts to that, recognize it, don't be afraid of it, but make a game plan to deal with it. See, things of your habits, your trends, your behaviors, all this stuff, if not dealt with the soul ties, they will affect your marriage. You know, if, if you're here today and you're like, man, you know, maybe you missed last week with the rope and the soul ties, I just want to encourage you that. I, I never want you to look at your past and be like, oh my goodness, I shouldn't even be in this church. Oh my goodness, what's God doing right now? I want to encourage you today that God wants to take your past. He wants to set you free from that past. But also now that past is becoming a tool instead of something that you're like trying to hide away, something that you're ashamed of. And God's going to say, you know what, as you go into this new relationship, we're going to bring the past with us. And in, as God begins to bring healing, he needs to also set us free in our mind. I remember uh, the week, it was like a week process where I had a ring and I wanted to ask uh, my, you know, my wife to, to marry me, take my, uh, you know, will you have your, your hand in my marriage or whatever. And something like that. Something like that, right? Will you marry me? Show her. If you're single here, here's what you do. Get a nice ring. Spend some money on that. 
and they go, will you show the diamond, and she'll be all distracted, and she'll say yes no matter what, okay? <laughs> will you diamond marry me? Yes, all right, tricks you. But the week up, I, I remember I called her, uh, her dad, Todd, and I said, Todd, may I, may I, you know, uh, may I marry your daughter? May I have permission? And Todd's like, sure, no, whatever, you know. <laughs> and then I called uh, Lindsay's mom and her stepdad and said, you know, can we, it's kind of awkward, it's like, hey, can I buy you guys dinner, but don't tell your daughter? You know what I mean? Like, so yeah, you already know what it's about, you know? And so they were at the restaurant with me and having a meal, and I said, may I uh, marry your daughter? May I have your daughter's hand in marriage? And, uh, and this is what my mother-in-law said. She said, she didn't say like, yes. You know what I mean? She said, are you sure you can handle her? <laughs> and she said, we don't take returns in this family. I said, can you expound on that a little bit more now? But you know what? I say that because, A, I mean, people that are doing live, parents, things like that, they have an inside on the past. They have an inside on all the quirks, the habits, the ideas, all those things. And it's just been, it's been an amazing process for us. And I want you to know that you have to look at the track record. It will help you begin to prepare. You have to look, look at the track record as it begins to help us to prepare. What does that mean? It means what you value now, you're going to value later. What you value in your life now, you're gonna carry it into your new relationship, what you're exposed to now. And so many times, you know, it's, it's sometimes we become what we hate sometimes, and we, don't you just hate that? Where you're like, I'm exposed to that, and then later on you're doing exactly what you were exposed to, and you're going, I hate that, I wish it wasn't that way. Why? Because we're trying to fix ourselves. Jesus is the only one who can heal us from what we've been exposed to in Jesus' name. But what does that mean? I value what I value now, I value later. For an example, uh, my mom always cooked dinner, uh, right? My mom always cooked, my dad was always working, and so when we got married, I was like, what's for dinner? And she's like, cook yourself. I was like, oh man, okay, this is all. No, I said, shared checking, we're going out to dinner. <laughs> I said, wow, this is interesting. Even, I think it was like two years of me being married or something like that, I'm like seven, like, like, like two years, she was like, um, babe, take the trash out. I was like, whoa. I thought we did this together, you know what I mean? Like, wow, like, you can take out the trash. I give you permission to take the trash out. But I say that because growing up in her household, dad always took trash out. Like, he always took the trash out, so Lindsay's like, it is the man's job to take the trash out. I said, well, let me write that down, and now I know, so I can take the trash out all the time. And there's just different things, that even what you're exposed to, you bring it to your relationship. My family, growing up, it was very passive, very like, you know, oh, you were late again, you know what I mean? <laughs> my dad come in at like midnight, my mom was like, you're really late, Larry, you know? Yeah, then they go to bed. Like, that was strange. <laughs> like, I think that was an argument, I don't know, being a Midwest boy. My wife's family, very direct, still direct, all right? You don't, you don't know what, you don't have to wonder what they're thinking, all right? You know exactly what they're thinking. She's like, I'm upset with you, oh my God. What's that mean? That means we have to work together to say, you know what, we need to work on this process. Because many of us, we get married, we go on a honeymoon, and we come back, and we're slapped in the face by reality. We're going, what in the world's going on here? Because what you've been exposed to becomes your new normal. And in a relationship, if your parents fought, and they threw things, or broke things, or yelled and screamed, and all of a sudden you're upset in your new relationship, and you're yelling and you're screaming because it's normal, and your spouse is going, I just married an ex-murderer. Like, this person is crazy. Like, is there a moment? Like, how many days until? But I say that because we have to begin to bring in our own exposures and our own values to say, this is what we value. You know what? There's a lot of yelling in my house. I'm, I want to make a request, no yelling in this house. Begin to work through that. We all have different upbringings. For me, I was a, just a good Christian kid. And, it, and one of the reasons I love pastoring a church is because a lot of times we minister out of our story. And for me, growing up in church, I knew church, but I never knew God. And so I love getting Christians saved. That's what I love doing. I love taking people to say, yes, you know church, you know religion, but do you know Jesus as your Lord and your Savior? Is he your own God? Is he someone that you can know God and then begin to find that freedom? And so going through high school, I was afraid of God. I didn't have a healthy fear of the Lord. I, I was terrified of him. I was like... You know, every time I messed up, deep in the night, right? Trumpet blown somewhere. It's, it's, you know, I'm missing heaven. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to make it because God is so mean. He's so, he's so upset with me. 
I, I even uh, would, would avoid sinning in any way I could because I'm so afraid that if I made a mistake, God would heal my ears, that God would heal my body. I'm so afraid of, of just making, you know, getting caught with my pants between my legs that I would never make it into heaven. And, and, I, and as, I, as I began to be set free by that, I began to realize God was a God of grace. God's God of mercy. And as I began to go into that process, I was a virgin when I got married. And I got to tell you this. Let me tell you this. I was a virgin when I got married, and I ain't ugly. All right? Because there was something that I held so dearly to my heart. And say, you know what? I want to I wanna give this to somebody to spend the rest of my life with. And uh, even, even the week I got married, uh, a, a good friend of mine, he sent me a book. And uh, some of you already recognize this book, right? He sent me a book in the mail to my, to my church office. And so I'm like, I open it up, and they're like, Jeremy, you got mail. All the pastors are looking at me. And I'm like, yeah. And I pull it out, and I go, oh, no. Sex for dummies. I said, thank you. Thanks a lot. And it's by Dr. Ruth. No. No. And I tell you that because we have different upbringings. We have different stories. Right. I was quite the contrary to Jeremy. Now, my mom did have a rule in the house. If you lived in her house, if your bed was under her roof, you went to church. Parents, that's not a bad rule. We have so many parents that, oh, my kid gets to make the decision. No, my mom gave me an option of hearing Jesus, an opportunity, I should say, not an option, an opportunity to hear Jesus every single Sunday, and it just became routine for me. I knew that if I was at home on Saturday night, I'm going to church on Sunday morning, and my friends, too, if they spent the night on Saturday night, their parents were warned ahead of time, you're going to church with my daughter on Sunday morning. But I was someone, yes, you can applaud that, good job, Mama. <laughs> but I was someone who just took up a seat, to be honest. And nothing was going into my heart. It was in one ear, out the other. I was there more out of obligation and duty because that's what my family did. There was no real heart connect for me. And as a teenager, I was reckless with relationships. I did not, see, he says girls had a, a vision since they were two. I never envisioned myself in a white wedding dress. I envisioned myself 30, living in New York, by myself, single, with a red Corvette. I don't know what I'm thinking because New York traffic, but I wanted to live on my own. With a bunch of cats. Never, I didn't want animals. <laughs> but I did, I wanted to be single, I wanted to be successful, because I, I didn't see a lot of good examples growing up, and I felt better when I was in control and not in relationship with somebody else emotionally. But I did, I was careless, physically. And so it was August of 2002, I was a senior, I just graduated. I came to church again that Sunday because that was the rule. But something was different and that day my heart was, was just broken before God and I gave my life to Christ. That moment in that summer, everything changed for me. And so I, I walked through with, with a small group how to forgive myself for the things that I've done, how to not be seen as what I've done, but be seen of who Christ is in me, that I wasn't defined by experiences, good or bad. I was simply defined by the fact that Jesus Christ gave his life for me, and I'm brand new. So 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, and the old is, had been gone. Now, it was a process for me to recognize that my old self was gone. I still had friends that wanted to remind me of the old self. I still had these things that I look back or these feelings or that song or that smell that would take me back to that old place. But I had to come to grips that I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. And so as I was a Christian, I got saved, I got called to the ministry. Here I am never knowing what God can do. I can tell you right now, you never know what God can do. Who would have thought that God would have taken some party girl like me who didn't give a rip about caring about anybody get her to give her life to Christ and then set her up in a position that I called you to be a leader. And I didn't just call you to be a leader of anybody. I called you to be a leader in a church. And I'm going to give you a teammate. It was incredible. And so I can tell you, you're welcome. <laughs> but I can tell you from the time that I gave my life to Jesus in August of 2002, I remained abstinent until my wedding night on October 28th, 2007. Right. Because I learned that the Bible wasn't about a bunch of rules and regulations. The Bible was about blessing. 
The Bible was showing me who I was and that holiness was, was an awesome opportunity. It wasn't an obligation in my life. And I really began to find out who I was, and I'm so grateful that I did. And see, that's freedom in Christ Jesus. And that's what we want for you. This is what we want for this church. When you, when you walk through these doors, we want you, number one, to know God. Because only then, is, then you can begin to find freedom. We want you to live a life in the freedom of Christ Jesus. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 says, Stand therefore in freedom. Don't be bound again by slavery. Don't be bound again by, by those choices that we make, but by freedom. We are set free in Christ Jesus. And so as, begin, as we begin to work on our foundation, some of our heroes like, I don't have vision for my life, but let's help you. For some here, you're like, I don't have a foundation in my life, then we want to help you. And so write this down. I want you to write this down. Before you commit to a promise, I want you to commit to a process. Before you commit to a promise, commit to a process. My wife quoted the scripture in Corinthians that and I want to pull out from that. All things, it says, becomes new. All things become new. For many of us, we think, okay, God, I need a microwave right now. I need you to fast forward this thing. I need a boom. I'm quick. I'm set free. I'm saved. I'm ready for a relationship. I'm ready to get out there. And God is saying, listen, it's a process. It's a process. We want to walk you through that process. If you already made the promise and you haven't gone through the process, hold on to that promise. I want you to hold on to that promise that you have and say, God, I'm going to go through the process. Why? Because in the process, all things, let's say some things, or if you're right, or if you did it the good way, it says all things. Say all things. It says all things become new. We don't want you just to get you saved. We want to get you free. We want to get you free. And not only do we want to see you free, we want you to discover who God created you to be, that your identity is in Christ Jesus. And then we want you to make a difference in this city and through this church. That groups are powerful. For, for many of us here in this room, some of us, we just need new friends. We need those that can rally around us to say, hey, let me encourage you. Hey, let me, let me give you some godly advice, not just my opinion. Hello. Let me help you in this marriage. If you're about to get married, get in a group with healthy married couples. Those that can, that can argue and fight and still be godly together. Those that can have a godly relationship and you can expose yourself to those. Learn to read God's word. You know what? We want to encourage you to do that. Pray together as a couple. Expose your marriage and even parenting styles to other godly couples. I remember when we first got married, we were hanging out with some friends. They had two kids. And uh, they're just still great, great friends to this day. But even seeing some like a parenting style, like, that's a little strange. I probably won't do that. But because I was exposed to it, I find myself repeating it. So we had a son who did the same thing. It's not necessarily a terrible thing. But we did it, and I was like, oh, no. I've never been exposed to that until them, right? Like, you know. Why? What we exposed to, often we repeat. Expose your marriage and your parenting styles to other godly marriages. Because we adopt our past experiences into our new experiences. If you don't like how something is done or handled in your marriage, talk about it. See, that's the problem. You don't win because you're louder in the relationship, okay? You don't win because you're stubborn and you refuse to talk, and that's how you're going to win. No, we don't fight. We do fight. Hear me? <laughs> we argue. We're married. Hello. That's what happens. We don't. But we don't fight to win an argument. We fight to win our relationship. We work through some things. And so when I say that, win the relationship. There's going to be compromises, but there's things that you have to talk about on the table. We didn't fight until we had a kid. No joke. We pretty much, we pretty much agreed on almost everything. We are the best of friends. We get along so well. We enjoy each other's company. We work together. Hello. We had one car. Hello. We slept in the same bed. Hello. We were together all the time, but we enjoy each other. But four years into marriage, we have a little one, and I'm like, whoa. <laughs> you want to do what with him? Oh, you want to let him cry during the night? That's my baby. You don't do that. Your mother was a Nazi. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. He just took his hearing aid out and done. But we started fighting because we did not agree on how to raise up Levi in those little ages. And so what we wish somebody would have told us is start talking about, talk about it now, what's going to happen later. No one told us, why don't you guys start talking about how you're going to parent you know, when you have future children. Well, that's the future. We don't talk about it. Yes, you do. Because it came one of the biggest arguments in our marriage early on. And so what you do is you come to the table and you say, okay, this is how you were brought up. This is what you think. Well, this is what I think. Well, how are we going to think? 
What's going to be the tone for our marriage moving forward? I may need to make some compromises. You need to make some compromises. Let's settle on something where our relationship wins, where our family wins. Because even think about our little ones. Your, their, their parents are, are executing two different plans, and there's confusion in their life. They said, you know what, I was raised this way, so man, I was under communism and my mom was a dictator. And so man, we didn't have rights, you know, I'm like, we didn't, we didn't own anything. There were seven children in his family. I only had a couple seven in my kids. family. All right, we dug a tunnel out of the house. <laughs> and my wife, she had a wonderful upbringing with her sister and her parents. Just perfect, just amazing. <laughs> And so in this process, I'm going, no! And she's going, yes. And we're trying to figure this out, this journey. And I'm getting upset. She's upset. And now, I think we can have another one, right? He won't be as messed up or jacked up, right? Why? Cry all night. Because we had, oh, write that, videotape that. Why? Because we're now having that conversation. Now we're prepared. You know, wars have started because of miscommunication. Wars have started because I. I'm assuming that's what you're thinking. I'm assuming you're gonna follow my lead. And we have to be careful, but here's our last point today. Write this down, is work on your issues. Work on your issues. Now notice I said, I said your issues, not their issues. Some of you might have to like underline your a couple of times, all right? Make it bleed on that paper. Why? Because just so many times we wanna blame the other person. I have a bad marriage because of you. I, I, I'm unhappy because of you. I, I, I want to encourage you. We all have issues, all right? And so every single person in this room, we have to work on your issues. If you're single here, you got issues, right? So turn to your neighbor and say, you got issues. All right, turn to your other neighbor and say, you got 99 problems. <laughs> we got to work on our issues. We all have problems, but some, here's sometimes what happens. Is that we begin to set the standards so high that we're expecting them to be like Jesus when we're living life. Judas. <laughs> we can't set that standard so high in their life if we're not going to achieve that standard in our life. So let's begin to be godly in that. My wife said, you know, uh, she had a, a list for a spouse. For many of us, we need to have that prayer list she talked about. Instead of saying, God, fix them, and God, what's wrong with them? Begin to write a prayer list out. Say, God, I pray there's more humility in my life. God, I pray I'm, I'm not angry as much. Father, I pray that when I go through this situation, this scenario, I pray I can be Christ-like in this marriage. That by my actions, I pray I can, whether it's influence her, with them to Jesus, whatever it is, to say, you know what, may I make a difference in their life and in my marriage. You see, humility says, what's the problem? Where's the issue at? I need to address it. I need to, I need to give this to Jesus. Humility says, what's the problem? But pride says, who's the problem? Who's the problem? If many times, we, if we don't begin to face what we've been exposed to, if we don't face our past experiences, we're going to go into another relationship, and then another relationship, and another relationship, blaming others to say, God, there's an issue with my heart. God, I need to give you my life, and I need to lay it all down. The Bible says if we humble ourselves, God will begin to exalt us in due time. And I believe that in due, in due time, it's going to be freedom. In due time, it's going to be a healthy marriage. In due time, it's going to be something amazing. Your life. Jesus will fix and heal them. You fix yourself. You fix you and begin to work on that journey, work on that process. Because there's a reality. If you're not healthy on the inside, your marriage won't be healthy. If you're an angry person and you're just like, that's just the way I was, that's just my culture, right? like, I'm just angry, well, then you're going to have an angry marriage. We've got to begin to work on those things. And there are resources, uh, counseling. For some of us, like, ooh, that's, that's not okay. Yes, it is. And the problem is people will sometimes wait too, too long to get to counseling. Counseling is an excellent resource. Some of the greatest leaders in the world will tell you that they have a counselor who they get to go speak to. And so counseling can help you attack the problems and stop attacking the person. Maybe you've had a, a great rift happen in your family and there is some, some deep-seated resentment. There's anger, there's hurt, there's pain. And even though maybe the person has corrected some of their behavior, your heart has not been corrected. That's something that can happen in counseling. There's great books out there. People have been through what you've been through. Sometimes we think we're the only one in the world who's going through what I'm going through. It's not true. There are thousands of people that have gone where you are going through right now. And so pick something up. 
Joyce Meyer, if you're having a hard time with your thought, not that one, <laughs> if you're having a thought process with Battlefield of the Mind, Andy Stanley is a great author, New Rules for Sex, Love, and Dating. There's Les and Leslie Parrott, excellent resources. Um, CBE.org, you guys can go on there and look at uh, books for that. There's wonderful things to help you to pursue uh, just God and joy in your life. There's even, honestly, times of separation. If you are in a harmful relationship where you and your family are in danger, are in harm, there's a healthy separation time for that. Please understand that. We're not asking you to chin up and pray that the good Lord saves your marriage while being in a place where you are being abused or harmed or hurt. I'm not asking you to do that at all. In fact, I feel that it is foolish. But there is time where you can separate the physical part of your life. And in the meantime, I can get right with God and he can show me how to forgive. He can show me what he wants me to do. And I can pray and believe that God is going to do a work in my spouse. And so believe me, there's plenty of resources to help people get through these types of things and don't neglect prayer and fasting. Amen. I mean, I, I remember one resource that taught us how to fight. I remember that when we were uh, first married, we were getting an argument or whatnot, and then she, uh, you know, to make up. Like, how do you, how you make up? It's not just, you know, we're going to go in the bedroom and make up. That's not what it is. It's just, how do we make up? How do we, how do we move forward from here? And the way I wanted to make up was, let's, let's solve this problem right now. Let's talk about it. And we're going to, we're going to just, because I don't like it. I don't like it in the air and elephant in the room. Let's talk about this right now. She would leave. She would just take off. I'd be like, oh, no. Like, like please don't leave me, right? And she would get in the car. And she would, like, drive around the block or go somewhere. And uh, But here's the thing she never did. She never went to parents. She never was like, Mom, this guy's crazy, all right? Like, you hear what he did? And she'd be like, yeah, you're right. You can stay here. She never did that. And the reason why we encourage you not to do that is because you begin to pour into your parents. And then when you come back, you kiss and you make up and you're better and you reconcile. Guess what? The parents did not. And so then you go over for family dinner and you're like, pass the potatoes. And your mother-in-law's like, I will cut you. And you're like, what? <laughs> like, why are you mad at me? Because I'm not vegan? Like, what's going on here? <laughs> so we encourage you not to do that. But now over 10 years, the Bible says two become one flesh. And in that, even our ideas have changed. Our ideas begin to morph. So now she doesn't just leave for hours and hours, and now I'm not like, we need to sell this right now. Literally, we begin to see the same process, but in a matter of minutes. Where she's like, I need to go down the room for a couple minutes. Okay, I'll let you, I'll, I'll let you go. Then she'll come back in, and we're going to have a healthy conversation and communicate why we feel what we feel. Because you did this, I feel that you, you know, and begin to work through that process so many resources out there, and I want to encourage you, let's work on our issues. And it's okay to have issues, but let's begin to work on them. And the Bible says in Romans 8.28, and I want to encourage you with this today, that Romans 8.28 says, and we know that in all things, there's that word again, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. So let's keep our eyes on Jesus. Some, sometimes it's like my marriage is so terrible. Uh, man, I just, I'm not happy with my spouse or my husband. I encourage you, let's get our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And the Bible says, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God has called you to have a great marriage. God has called you to have a thriving life. God has called you to begin, to begin a legacy in your children's children. For us, that's vision for my life, for my kids to say, my mom and dad stayed together. My mom and dad love each other. I need, I want, I want a daughter someday to say, my, I want a man, that, I want a man like my dad because he loves my mommy so much. That's vision for your life. Vision for our lives, for us to be old, drinking coffee somewhere with a hairline down to here. Yeah, you know I mean, and if I show up on Sunday, my hairline's down to here, just say, nice shoes, Pastor. I said, thank you, Pastor. <laughs> but God works together for the good. He's working on your behalf working on your behalf. I got to uh, just tell you today, too, as we close, that the Bible says that God, he hates divorce. Exactly what my wife, my wife said. Now, if you're in an abusive marriage, we're not asking you to chin up and suck it up out of her. If you're in an abusive relationship that, that goes against the word of God, we want you to get out of that relationship. We want you to seek some help. So God hates divorce, but he loves you. But he loves you. And I begin to see God that whatever the devil is intended for evil, that God turns it around for good. He begins to do a miracle. 
in my story, my upbringing, I got to tell you, I was afraid, before I met my wife, I was afraid of marriage. I'd say, man, my, my great-grandpa got divorced, and my grandpa got divorced, and my dad got divorced, and my parent, my mom got divorced, and, and, and I, it's, there's a curse in my life. I'm terrified of this. And I had to begin to say, God, will you, will you help me in that? Especially when I met Lindsay, I was like, God, thank you for healing that, Lord. God hates divorce, but he loves you. And so when my mom divorced my dad, she had biblical reason to do that. That back then he was unfaithful before he followed Christ. But then in their divorce stage, she was a single mom. And I got to tell you, if you're a single parent in this room, man, we commend you. We honor you. But the thing about my mom and even her second husband is they had the local church. A church that said, hey, we'll cook meals for you. Hey, we'll, we'll help you get your kids. We'll bring, go pick your kids up. Why? Because we're family. That's what it's about. When my, when my parents got divorced, I remember just being wrecked and, and exposed to all of that. But there's a guy in our church. I was friends with his son, Tony. And he had four kids with his wife, Carol, but they got separated. And in, in a season of being separated, she developed some depression issues and had some medical issues. But he was fighting for her marriage. He was fighting for her. But she would flee. And one day, while they were separated, not divorced yet, she called and said, hey, can we, can, can we pick up the kids? Can we go to a movie? And he was like, wow, this is what I've been praying for. This is exactly what ought to happen. Like, there's hope. We're taking a step forward. So he took her and the kids, and they all went to a movie. And I even asked my stepbrother about this, and he said, man, I remember that experience seeing mom again and going to a movie and feeling like a family again. He was so encouraged. And so they, 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 they said goodbye to mom and they stayed at dad's house that evening. And I've been also to the family. She went home that evening. She committed suicide. So here's my, you know, friend's dad. He's a widow at a very young age. He's going through the process of can I love again? Going through the process of being alone going through the process of how do I raise kids without mom? How do I go through this? But he had Jesus Christ. He had help in the local church. I got to tell you, he met my mom. And even that process, I was like, don't touch my mother, you know. <laughs> Who are you? But he met my mom, and they came home one night. I remember he wore just a nice suit. Never seen that before. And I was like, what is this? And, and he proposed to my mom, and they said, we're getting married. And I got to tell you, what's happened in that process, that God hates divorce, but he loves you. That in this process, my dad found a godly woman. In the process, my mom married this godly man. And to this day, people ask me, you wish your parents were still together? And I'll say, oh, of course I do. But let me tell you this. The way my stepdad now treats my mom is a blessing. He's godly, he honors her. That you know what? He's redeemed marriage for me. Just to see what he did. Even their kids, through that mess up of a suicide, losing mom, through the mess up of, of a divorce, his kids, uh, what is he? He's got three, three of his sons are pastors. They're serving in the local church. So now, to this day, you know, I don't go, that's my stepbrother, that's my stepbrother. I got 10, right? That's my stepbrother. That's my stepbrother. You might know that's not my stepbrother. I have so many. <laughs> but to this day, I don't say that's my stepbrother. I say that's my brother. Why? Because God's healed. God's restored. Why? Because God works together for the good. For the good. So our desire is for God to do a work in your marriage. Don't fix it, but give it to Jesus. Don't throw it away. Don't quit. Don't give up. Let's work on that process as we keep that promise. So can you stand with me, please? I'm going to pray with everybody this morning. We bow our heads and you close your eyes. I would just love to pray for every single person in this room. Man, if you're single in this place, I want you to know the pinnacle of your life is not getting married or dating or finding somebody. The pinnacle of your life is finding Jesus Christ. Finding Jesus Christ. Then even if you're single in this room and you're saying, I'm content with not getting married. 
uh, I'm not asking you to write a spouse list. I'm asking you to write a list for, for Jesus in your life. Say, God, what do you want me to accomplish in my life? What are the plans you have in my life? What can you do in me and through me? So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to pray for married people today. I want to pray over your marriage. I want to pray hope and healing, restoration. I want to pray for a vision in your marriage. I want to pray for that foundation in your marriage. In Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for who you are. God, I thank you. You're a God of grace. You're a God of mercy. And God, we pray for every single person that's in this room today. That God, I pray you begin to touch and heal marriages. And Father, I pray for those that have uh, exposure to the past, those that have soul ties. That God, I pray we begin to give that to you. That Father, as we begin to know you, we begin to know freedom. That Father, I pray you begin to set us free, equip us, give us the tools and resources to have vision for our relationship. 40, 50, 60, 70 years down the road, still married, still thriving. And if you're here today, maybe you don't have any hope. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, man, I don't know about all this. Maybe you're here today and you say, I've never accepted Jesus as my Savior. I don't have that spiritual foundation because I don't know who Jesus is. But today's something different. Today, I want the very best that God has for my life. With every head bowed, every eye closed, and that is you today. You say, Pastor, will you pray a prayer with me? I'm not asking you to join our church. I'm not asking you to go to road track step two or even get the group. I'm just asking you today, can I lead you in a prayer? Can I introduce you to Jesus Christ? We'll begin to say, let's go on a process. Let's take some steps towards freedom. Let's take some steps towards a process. If that is you today, with every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to pop a hand up and pop it right back down. If that is you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. That's awesome. That's awesome. Man, I'm going to pray over you, church. I'm so grateful. I'm grateful what God is doing. That yes, we can have fun, but also we can say, God, do what only you can do. God, heal, restore, place marriage back in its original intent, and do a work in my life. But everyone say this after me. Say, Dear Jesus, thank you for, for loving me right where I am. But today, I give you my life. Forgive me of my sins and wash me clean. That today, you were raised to life. So raise me to new life. That after today, I will follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Everybody shout it. Amen. Amen. Come on, get that praise.